Who, first of all, who is he? Who, who is Teilhard de Chardin for people who have not, you know, really are not very familiar with him? Uh, Teilhard is one of the most fascinating persons of the 20th century. Mm. He was a French uh, writer, thinker, a Christian um, uh, mystic or theologian or with enormous impact on the 20th century. In fact, there are few, if any, uh, personalities of the 20th century that have been written about so much as Teilhard. The bibliography of works written about him was into the thousands. I believe in the French language there were 5,000 uh, titles, mm -hmm. enormous amount of literature, mm -hmm. much more literature than about some of the other personalities that were well known and were influential, but uh, somehow have not elicited the range of response that Teilhard has elicited because his thinking covered such a vast uh, field of, um, of concern mm -hmm. about okay. the total human venture. He was scientist, he was theologian, he was a great personality, he was mm -hmm. a Westerner in China for 20 years. Mm -hmm. he, there was a great deal of challenge about his thinking and so forth. And he was born in 1881. He lived up to 1955. He was born in a period, of course, when so many changes took place in our human life and human thought and the sense of values. And when the human was just entering into this great petrochemical age, oh, when yes. the roads were being built, when the radio came into existence. Mm -hmm. uh, and those of us that can remember the early radio programs, mm -hmm. of course, you reveal your age when you say <laughs> 1917, the, uh, mm. when KDKA in Pittsburgh uh, had the first uh, uh, commercial radio program. Mm -hmm. uh, a person can see that um, Teilhard's life spanned a great period of time. Mm -hmm. And then there were the great thinkers that lived during this time. Einstein, who changed our whole view of the scientific world, came. Um, Darwin's work was uh, a dominant work. And probably what gave the, the central focus to Teilhard's life was the discovery of the evolutionary theory and the fact that Western religious thought had not been able to assimilate it, and perhaps few things have changed our intellectual pers perspective on things, and have so challenged our religious cultural traditions as the evolutionary hypothesis of Darwin. Mm -hmm. What? Uh, but then, Tom, uh, what? What do you think are the kind of major contributions he's made to the ecological age to this period? Now? Well, that is a. Uh, that's a great challenge because that's somewhat the pathos of Teilhard is that there is an aspect of his thinking that is, that, uh, is not easily compatible with the ecological age. But the more fundamentals of his thinking are the basic support of the ecological mm, age. It's interesting. Kind it's, of that. And so that when we think of Teilhard, we have to think of perhaps the person who, inter who altered Christian thought perhaps more than anybody since the time of St. Paul. Really? Perhaps. Really? Yeah. Perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly since the time of St. Thomas. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the whole thought structure of human existence has changed more drastically in these last few hundred years than any time before. And if you move Christianity from the context in which it was born into this context, obviously that's mm -hmm. going to make the greatest mm -hmm. change. Okay. The change that uh, St. Thomas brought into the picture by moving from a more Platonic to a more Aristotelian context is minor compared to what we are faced uh -huh. with. And the question is, can we do it or not do it? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And Teilhard was seminal in all of that. Well, like he that. was a central figure. Yeah. Okay. And compared to the other people, like Barth, or who was a great theologian, certainly even Tillich. Mm -hmm. uh, these were great thinkers, but uh, none of them had the knowledge, the scientific, scientific. knowledge that mm -hmm. Teilhard did. Mm -hmm. So 
when it comes to somebody that had a great depth of scientific knowledge. And uh, his special field was paleontology oh, yes. uh, and geology. It was deep into the geological sciences, mm -hmm. the biological sciences, and to comparative uh, paleontological studies. Mm -hmm. And he was part of some of the great expeditions in uh, research. Yeah. Didn't he? He lived some of his life in China. He was well, in Well, he lived um, 20 yeah. years of in his China. life. He went to China in the mid-20s, and he left in the mid-40s. Okay. Well, in 1946, I believe. Mm -hmm. So now, what, what would you say, though? Like, if you were to say one, two, three, four, five, or whatever, what contributions do you think he's really made to this age? Well, you, there were several. I'm, I'm sure there are many. If a person reduced them to one thing, the, the great thing that he did was to make a commitment to the evolutionary process. Uh, a total commitment for an for outstanding Christian thinker to make that total commitment that he made to the evolutionary process in the, 19, uh, in the second decade of this century mm. when Christians were, were very adverse to accepting the implications of the evolutionary um, uh, interpretation of things. Mm -hmm. it's something more than hypothesis, the evolutionary uh, uh, view. Mm -hmm. It's something that is, has the factual evidence uh, that is difficult not to accept. Mm -hmm. But Christians have always found great difficulty. They thought that it challenged the whole basic structure of the of faith. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. he immediately saw that no matter what happened to the faith or what happened to uh, anything else, we had to follow the evidences that were before us. Yes. And so he accepted the evidences, committed himself definitively to that, and then he got in trouble. With the church, because the structure of Christianity and its dogmatic teaching, its religious interpretation, is based largely on the concept of an original paradisal state where there was a fall into what we call original sin. Right. Uh, original sin was, we might almost say, was an invention of St. Paul in the sense you have a savior figure, you need something to be saved from, and so you have original sin. But the first Adam, it is in the Bible, the original sin, in Genesis, obviously. But Adam is never mentioned in the Old Testament except in that beginning. Adam plays no role in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but uh, there was, however, that sense of need of redemption, that divine human relations were radically disturbed and that things could not be set right except by a savior personality. And so we get the, and the turmoil of the prophetic age and the difficulties of dealing with existence and then the promise of a savior personality that would bring about this transformation, restore divine human mm -hmm. union, give humans hope that the human condition would be transformed. Mm -hmm. And it was this that developed into the backgrounds of the incarnation, the redemption, as Christians presented, as it's presented in the Gospels. And such a central... That's a central thing. And then okay. St. Paul, in explaining Christ, he goes back and has the first Adam and the second Adam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it develops, everything develops out of that relationship. Uh -huh. And so we develop the, the doctrines, all the salvation doctrines of the faith. But when, um, when Teilhard came along in 1922, he wrote an essay on original sin, saying that this uh, makes a great difficulty <laughs> if you accept the fact that we are in an emergent universe that moves from earlier forms to later forms to more developed forms. Mm -hmm. And as it goes through more developed forms, the, um, it's not a collapse of some perfect age and a re restoration of something of yeah. that nature. Right. That it is an emergent process that from the beginning was a simpler and 
uh, process that begins even with uh, particles of matter that we call atomic uh, particles or galactic systems and the shape of things unfolds through time and so forth. And all of that is sacred. Yeah. All of that. Is what? Is sacred. Sacred. Oh, yeah. certainly. Yes. Yeah, all of the... that has this, uh, from the beginning, a spiritual dimension. Yeah. There's no such thing as crass matter, and it has that sense. But that cause, that's a central fact of Teilhard's intellectual life and the tension between the religious authorities mm -hmm. in Teilhard, which mm -hmm. a person has to keep in mind, mm -hmm. because much of what happened and much of his writing is to balance out a very sensitive Christian theological um, context with the modern scientific context. Okay. But his genius was that he was able to uh, keep his relationship with both, although he was, in a certain sense, alienated from both. Mm -hmm. Because you're a Christian, you're an orthodox scientist, that is, you're a more mechanistically oriented scientist, found it difficult to deal with Teilhard's interpretation of the universe as having a psychic consciousness mm -hmm. aspect from the beginning. And uh, that was on the one hand, so the, uh, that type of scientist could not uh, deal adequately with right. Teilhard, nor can the theological, on the other hand, mm -hmm. the theological, the religious side, they had difficulty with Teilhard because he was so deep into the scientific world. Mm -hmm. yeah. Say something more than but, Tom well, about let that. Me, let me say just yeah. something more, though, about the, this article that he wrote in 1922. That wasn't a big problem until 1924. And then he was invited, he had a chance to go to China for the Jesuits had a, a, a research center in China, yes. in Tianjin. And because his studies were of this nature and so forth, he was, um, had become a distinguished personality already. Also at this time, at Chakoti Inn in North China, the, the excavations were being made for that it resulted in P this uh, discovery of the Peking skull, yes. which at that time was the foremost bit of, of um, paleontological Evidence. research concerning the origins of the human. But uh, at that time, that article was discovered was making trouble. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a certain sense of wanting to get Teilhard out of an influential position in Europe and get uh -huh. him out to the mission. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, uh -huh. so he gets into China. Uh -huh. Now, in China, uh, once he's there, he's, um, he comes back and the real a tendency of it, from then on, he was an exile, a person might say. Mm -hmm. He did his work in China, he was part of that exped expedition of working with the, uh, those excavations at Chakotien. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and periodically he would go back to Europe and he was offered positions teaching in Europe and he was uh, had a great deal of recognition there. But mm -hmm. It, uh, his superiors insisted that he uh, keep spend, out of the keep limelight. Out, keep, that out way. Of, yeah. <laughs> keep out of the theological scene. Yeah, they, yeah. Uh, they didn't mind uh, his doing his scientific work, uh -huh. but they are uh, saw that the scientific work had fantastic implications for the total cultural development of the human and had mm -hmm. fantastic implications for Christian uh, vision of life yeah. and the whole uh, interpretation of, of Christianity. Mm -hmm. And so that he was, was a writer too. Mm -hmm. uh, and he had uh, a lyric uh, capacity with words and expressions mm -hmm. and he he was, had a vision. He was one of the great personalities mm -hmm. in interpreting and in, uh, in changing the whole cultural scene. Yeah. So that he, he is one of those vast historical personalities. Mm -hmm. And then the person say, well, uh, who would you compare him to and so forth? Well, um, 
to my mind, there are several personalities of the 20th century that are very important. There's uh, Carl Jung, and there's also, maybe we could explore that later, but, and see how Teilhard relates to these. But going back to the earlier stage and the scene mm. in which his thinking developed, mm. uh, let me just uh, uh, read a passage here. Uh, it's just a short passage from one of his uh, essays he wrote 1929, The Sense of Man, where he ends this, what must mark the Christian in the future is an unparalleled zeal for creation. Mm -hmm. So if I were to mark the, the, what's the great contributions of Teilhard, I, I would say three things uh, that he did. The first thing is that he, he told the, the story of the universe in an integral manner, and perhaps for the first time. Uh, for a long time, the scientists uh, had been searching out a way to tell the total story of the universe. Mm -hmm. Sir James Jeans had uh, written his explanation. Eddington had written his. But neither one of them quite... Uh, they understood the universe too somewhat. Uh, they understood that it had a psychic component, but they, um, and that that was um, central to the process, but they were not able to tell the story with the fullness and the richness that Teilhard told it. So that the phenomenon of man, it's really not the phenomenon of man, but the human phenomenon, as in the uh -uh. French title. Uh -uh. Uh, that story was written where he, I uh, told the story of the universe in its four basic phases, the galactic story, the earth story, life story, human story. Those four. Those are the four segments. Say that again, the, the great story. The galactic? The galactic story, the earth the story, story, life story. Life story. Human story. Human story. And each of these is integral with the others, mm -hmm. so that there's one story. But we might say, or for the sake of of articulating certain distinctive phases. There are many ways to do it, but that's one way yeah, to do it. Right. Uh, Teilhard was able to, to see that from the beginning, matter has uh, a psychic as well as a physical component and has a tendency either to accept one or the other of these and to eliminate the, uh, the other. Okay. Uh, psychic that, and, physical. and physical. Yes. That that uh, matter itself is, has intelligibility. Okay. If it has intelligibility, then it's not what might be called crass That's matter. Right. Otherwise, it would not have what I call radiant intelligibility, and Teilhard understood that. Mm -hmm. And so that he um, kept this um, sensitivity uh, to that, and he was able to tell the story of the universe as a progressive emergence of higher of ever ascending forms of consciousness mm -hmm. uh, throughout the earlier developments of the universe, from the beginnings of the mm -hmm. fireball on mm -hmm. through the galactic system, shaping the earth, origins of life, and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, later, somebody like uh, Ilya Prigogine would tell the story uh, in terms of the self-organizing power of the universe. The, so that uh, summary of his work by Eric Jansch has entitled uh, The Self-Organizing uh, uh, Universe. Mm -hmm. so, but Teilhard was the first to really put well, the physical and the psychic as, as integral. And, and as integral and to follow its, the sequence of its the, emergence mm -hmm. with the richness that mm -hmm. he was able to give to it. Mm -hmm. But so that uh, the great work of Prigogine is to identify the fact that even at the chemical level, there's a self-organizing mm -hmm. power. Mm -hmm. Now that's for religious people, when a person talks about a self-organizing universe, they get the impression, well, you're doing away with the divine controls of it or the extrinsic things. Well, there's, first of all, there's no out there. There's only, so to speak, an in here. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so that the best way to think of the divine as, uh, as uh, intrinsic to creation. Right. Okay. Because uh, 
obviously there would be no creation without except as manifestation, the divine one to manifest himself. He can't do it out there because yeah. there isn't any out there. There's only the any out there. Yeah. Otherwise, the divine would not be omnipresent yeah, yeah. and so forth. Right. Right. Yeah. So That certainly we, is a, a, a central insight and, and so fundamental then to the whole, all that has followed in, in kind of this development of the ecological age or this yeah. sense of the and sacredness. And development toward that. But let's go to the second point. Mm. The second point that he did was to identify the human as the dimension of the universe from the beginning. In other words, mm. uh, the universe is always integral with itself at all times and everywhere. That is, everything requires everything else, and it's not itself without everything else. This, uh, the world we have now couldn't be what it is unless what was before this was what it is, okay. was, and so forth. Okay. But this couldn't be what it is unless what came first had the power to produce this. this. I see. I see what you're saying. Unless the fireball could produce a, a galactic systems, uh, the fireball uh, neither could exist. Right. Or galactic, unless galactic systems could produce an earth. The earth couldn't exist mm -hmm. unless the whole universe produced a human. The human couldn't exist. So that the human is in a manner integral with the universe from the beginning. If you want to story, tell my story, you have to tell the story of the universe. Uh -huh. All right. All and right. that's what this, this television program not long ago called Creation, that was the last statement mm -hmm. in it. It was a magnificent story of creation. It ended with that statement that the story of the universe is the human story. Right, yeah. And so that... And that well, was a key insight of uh, Teilhard. That was, certainly, that, was that was one of the main things of Teilhard, and that has been further elucidated. Mm -hmm. And when he was saying this in the as early as 1930, mm -hmm. he has one called The Spirit of the Earth, uh, an essay that he wrote in 1930, and that was after he had gone... Uh, it, start, uh, it was on his way back to China. He had just traveled across this continent, across North America, and he rode it on the sh uh, aboard ship or when he was in the Pacific going back to China. Mm -hmm. It's a very wonderful essay called The Spirit of the Earth. That's where that was the first form, I think, of the phenomenon, the human phenomenon mm -hmm. that he wrote ten years later. later yeah. Yeah. But uh, that's the second. The third thing, though, that is so important with Teilhard is that he moved the question, the essential Christian issue, from the redemption to the creation. Now, this ex in uh, modern times, uh, because of the struggles of interpreting the Gospels, and the Epistle of St. Paul that came out in the 16th century and all our struggles to explain redemption and our attachment to redemption mm -hmm. and our feeling of being uh, caught amid the turmoil of time and wanting to get out of the universe mm -hmm. rather than to stay in the universe, uh, there was a kind of a Christian attachment to something, to anything but the universe. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so that it was salvation processes that Christians were looking for. And I said, it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. That to that have, like that thing I, I just read, that the, uh, the primary work of the Christian is this universe. If anything's going to be saved, nothing can be saved without everything else being saved. Uh -huh. So that uh, to move the issue uh, to... Uh, to creation, and this would be in accord with uh, with Duns Scotus' position mm -hmm. rather than Thomas' position, mm -hmm. that that the essential thing is the creation process, and a person has to see redemption as somewhere occurring in that process, as mm -hmm. kind of a divine a phase of divine presence in the universe and functioning with the universe. But it must be seen within the creation perspective. Mm. That really is a, you know, a very new kind of religious uh, stream. It's a, that's it's been, a new, it's you know, a quite emerging new thing today. For Christians, yeah. uh, we're always saying, second. "Don't love the world, love not the world, yeah. or the things in the world." And the transcendent. Yeah. Uh, to 
seek the things that are above. above. Well, yeah. You can't seek the things that are above unless you behold them in the things below. Yeah. And to make that radicalist distinction mm. between the, the uh, things above and the things below, it puts the whole creation in a state of chaos. Mm -hmm. And if the divine St. Paul says in the epistle to the Romans in his first chapter that we come to the not, through the things that are made, we come to the knowledge of the higher things. Mm -hmm. So then, it's, unless the earth were so gorgeous and so beautiful, we would have a grand idea of the divine. Yeah. Yeah. I always say that if we lived on the moon, our idea of the divine would reflect the lunar landscape. It'd be desolate. Our idea of God would be desolate. Because we learn from what this. What we learn this, from this what's around right us. Around there's no way to come to a perspective on the divine except through uh, our experience uh, that we have. We have mm -hmm. sense being. St. Mm -hmm. Thomas even says that there's nothing in the intellect that was not first in the senses. Yeah. So it's, well, anyway, there are these three, three things, yeah. but what, central things. Yeah, okay, so that certainly his... You know, those are just uh, deep, deep contributions. Would but you perhaps there are a couple, a couple other things that might be mentioned that I think are somewhat important as regards to uh, In understanding Teilhard, uh, before going uh, extensively mm. into the idea of how he relates to the ecological age, is um, his sense of, of, humor, of psychic energy. Mm -hmm. Uh, he lived during the uh, period of the vibrant period of the existentialists, uh -huh. when Camus and also um, Sartre and some of the other writers were were very depressed okay, about yeah. the the world and the chaos and the idea that you had to accept the fact that the that the universe is absurd. Yeah. A sense of an absurd universe. Okay. Uh, the universe that's presented, say, by Samuel Beckett. And Teilhard saw then very clearly the crisis of human energy, of psychic energy. Yeah. And the thing he was most afraid of in humans meeting the future was the dying down of what he called the zest for life. Zest for life. Zest yeah. for life. He wrote a thing using that as the English title. So he didn't use the French, but the zest for life. The zest for life. So that this, um, there is enormous need to be fascinated with life. If we're not fascinated with, with life, then we're just not going to have the psychic energy needed to uh, carry through the human endeavor in mm -hmm. any uh, fascinating or any fulfilling manner. Mm -hmm. So. There is that aspect mm -hmm. of his work. And then there's one other thing that needs to be emphasized also, is the, the mystical quality of the scientific venture. Mm -hmm. That is that uh, science he uh, once called a research as the highest form of worship. Oh my goodness. It yeah. was a, an extraordinary statement. Mm. But he has an essay, and uh, it's in the English edition of, uh, under the title of Human Energy, the last essay, and that has to do with uh, science and the, the high mission of the scientific world. I oh. sometimes say science is the yoga of the West. Yoga. That's our spiritual discipline. Now, mm -hmm. person say, how can you say that when science has been so me mechanistic? Right, right. that's time? the question. Well, that is a very important uh, phase of science, science had to move into a, a setting aside of the spiritual for a while in order to penetrate matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, to, and the, one of the great contributions of science is to, in its investigation of what we call matter, yes. to end up with the realization that uh, matter, crass matter, uh, they end up in the spiritual because they see the psychic component that matter is considered merely as crass, uh, uh, what might be called uh, just opaque matter. It's mm. not opaque. Yes. It's a luminous reality. It's a luminous or organizing uh, energetic process mm. that has in it the capacity to produce such a stupendous universe. Mm -hmm. 
And so that it has, it's something more than what the person might call simply matter, matter. as this was looked upon for a while. Once it's done that, then uh, it's, uh, and it turns toward a more uh, greater sensitivity to what we call the spiritual mm -hmm. or the numinous quality of matter, then we're back to uh, a new way of experiencing the divine. We're back to a new way of seeing what the primitive uh, human soul mm -hmm. have always seen, that the universe is pervaded by a numinous, uh, sacred mm -hmm. aspect of things. And because he was scientist and deeply religious, Yes. Teilhard was... He was the first was person to really, really... And that's why yeah, I say, may in a sense, be, have changed and be uh, Christian thinking uh, more than any thinker since Yeah, yeah. The mystical quality, quality of the scientific of the sci mention. Of the scientific that it mention. has a trans-scientific mission. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the person has to keep in mind that the, the dynamics of technology are non-technological, they're visionary, they're, in a sense, hopeful. It's almost a spiritual quality or drive, because yeah. we think technology is going to bring us to some mystical mode of existence. Uh -huh. Advertising yeah. is based on mysticism. Uh -huh. And the idea that it's taking us to this heavenly realm. Mm -hmm. They have this automobile drivers that take you up in the paradise. Yeah. And you can take a, advertise a bar of soap which will eliminate <laughs> all, all the tensions of the human condition and take you off to Wonderland, yeah. paradise. Well, yeah. all of that is, mm -hmm. is involved in, uh, in this process. Mm -hmm. So in some way, uh, TI's contribution has become distorted, though, in the technological uh, kind well, of... Well, let me, yeah, uh, that, what, the pathos of Teilhard, yeah. This is where uh, the, a person has to still be, uh, there's a critical dimension that a person has to bring to bear on Teilhard. Okay. Because although he did so much and understood so profoundly uh, uh, some of the issues that we're dealing with, he was over-fascinated with the human and is what might be considered um, a tech, um, what might be called anthropocentrism was mm. excessive. Uh -huh. He wanted the human to, through human intelligence, to conquer the, uh, the rest of the world uh -huh. and to control it. Uh -huh. Control it. I dropped my paper here, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my favorite, where I uh, have a, um, just a couple of passages that, that would be I might, helpful. I might yeah. uh, read you that here that mention something of this um, uh, control over matter, which was so, um, so in a certain sense, frightening that, um, that as humans, we are to um, conquer nature. Uh, he says in the phenomenon of the human, human phenomenon, the phenomenon of man, he wrote, when mankind is once realized that his first function is to penetrate, intellectually unify, and harness the energies which surround it in order still further to understand and master them. Mm -hmm there will no longer be any danger of running into an upper limit of its fluorescence. In mm -hmm. other words, it was so captivated with the idea of progress through technology. Mm -hmm. I say it did not have the sense of communion with the natural world. That the and human was somehow was, in communion. Was to control oh. it. Uh -huh. He had the idea we would, he did not commune with it the way the ecologists want to mm -hmm. commune with it. Mm -hmm. He was not ecocentric in that that thing. Uh -huh. So yeah. that is isn't that interesting because of his own you know work in, in paleontology and all that. You would think that the earth kind of a resonance with the earth would be very well. That's central, well, well that's what uh, when a person talks about Teilhard in the ecological age, this is what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Teilhard is 
enormously important in setting in the foundations yes. of this communion. In a certain sense, there is an ambivalence about Teilhard in this. And that is the point of it, and it's why a, an excessive cultic orientation to Teilhard is just not good uh -huh. and not sound. We need a beyond Teilhard, even. Uh -huh. And so the great mission uh, of of our times and those who understand and appreciate the enormous contributions of they are, uh, cannot stop where he stopped, I in see. my estimation. I see. And so when I proposed the, the idea of Teilhard in the ecological age, is not to say that he has provided a perfect interpretation of it, but that he has provided the principles. Now those three principles, uh, or those, even those five principles are very important, but the first three uh, uh, can be the basis mm -hmm. of a, a deep entry into this uh, type of ecological community mm -hmm. uh, that we're seeking. Mm -hmm. Yes. But the, the pathos is that Teilhard in his text is not that much into the ecological age. Now, why not? Well, uh, in a certain sense, the real tragedy of human oppression of the natural world had not quite begun. All right. uh, Rachel Carson had not written her book until uh, 1962. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, uh, that's when I would say the ecological age begins uh -huh. with that very stark presentation, although the earlier there was. In the whole of American history, this issue has been a dominant uh, item of our literature, Moby Dick of Melville. Conquering and, uh, conquering and, and mastering them. Yeah. Moby Dick is possibly the most significant uh, novel ever written to identify this human earth issue. Mm -hmm. And in the religious tradition, as uh, Ahab, his uh, psychic or pathological determination uh, to kill the whale, to dominate mm -hmm. the whale, has to do with, to a large extent, with the human mm -hmm. emphasis and intention to control the natural world. Mm -hmm. And also Mark Twain with that, with the raft, that simple raft of, um, of Huck and Huckleberry. the slave, mm -hmm. uh, when the steamboat comes down and smashes that, mm -hmm. Mark Twain is talking about the way in which the more early um, type of experience tends to be smashed mm -hmm. by the technological mm -hmm. world. And mm -hmm. you get it in Cooper. Uh, Fanny Moore Cooper wrote about the, the, in the Pioneers, uh, mm -hmm. one of his early leather stockings tales. He uh, writes about the, uh, the woodcutter. Yes. Only cut down all the trees. And even then, he said, Somebody, another character said, if you keep cutting down these trees, uh, you're going to devastate everything. And mm -hmm. so uh, Cooper was well aware mm -hmm. of this issue. Mm -hmm. So it's not exactly a new issue. But in the 20th century, when we got this enormous power over the natural world, it's become uh, just dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. And not only dangerous, catastrophic. Mm -hmm. uh, because we are into nuclear power and so yeah. forth. And that's where when Teilhard came into contact with nuclear power, he was totally in ecstasy over Isn't that interesting? Yeah. yeah. He went to visit the cyclotron in, uh, I guess, in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology or somewhere mm. in California. Mm. And he had a certain elation mm. over these experiences. Mm. So that what is needed in terms of the ecological issue is to be able to translate those early sensitivities of Teilhard into a more um, acceptable context. Yeah. Because the, in the ecological age, we need to see the universe as a community, and particularly the planet Earth, particularly in the, the biosphere. Mm -hmm. We need to encompass the Earth, for instance, with the America. What's the matter with 
the American Constitution. We're this the year of the Constitution, and everybody's saying that such a great document. Well, it's, it is a great document for humans. For humans, yeah. But what happens to the rest of the continent? Mm. It's uh, devastating for humans to be told they have all these rights, uh, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, at the expense of the natural world. Yeah. So yeah. what we need is a constitution for the North American continent, continent. Mm -hmm. where all the creatures would uh, understand each other in a single community, mm -hmm. a community of life. Mm -hmm. And this needs, of course, to be extended to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. um, in this sense, there is a... Um, uh, the, there is the great difficulty with okay, Teilhard. Right, yeah. There is something in Teilhard and what I may call an extension of the philosophes of the 18th century, almost, uh -huh. of a certain type of, of French uh, uh, clarity and brilliance and insight, but lacking in a certain emotional uh, rapport with, with the natural world. With, yeah. Rousseau mentioned some of that, but yeah. it's not, uh, it, this, the area of enlightenment mm -hmm. carried some of this, and then it was driven by the idea of progress. progress. Uh -huh. And Teilhard uh, translated progress into spiritual progress, into human progress, uh, to a certain extent at the expense of the natural world. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, let me yes. read you another passage. Just, it's a very important issue as regards to Yard, and I, um, I think that we need to deal with this in a certain amount of, of concern, and particularly with, uh, as we understand Teilhard, the, uh, it's important to uh, appreciate what uh, what he hoped for. He uh -huh. hoped for progress and for a type of, of overcoming the human condition. You see, what I call the human condition is the acceptance of the, uh, that we have a limited existence. Uh, there's no sense in hoping for uh, to get to a certain, uh, uh, that peace, and perfect peace, perfect mm -hmm. justice, perfect, mm -hmm ease with mm. life mm. to uh, uh, through mechanistic processes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Teilhard is over fascinated yeah. with mechanism. And that isn't the story of the earth. There's always chaos and, and struggle yeah, and yeah, violence the, yeah, for the creative. There's struggle and violence, but there's the creativity. Creative. Now, he wanted creativity, but he said that, that, that the artificial for the human is Perfect is a part of the natural order, but that when the that the two that in case uh, where the two uh, are compared to each other, the artificial is always better. Oh my goodness! Yeah. 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 In other words, like flying a plane and the flying of a bird. Uh, Bergson was into this. Bergson mm -hmm. is back of Teilhard. Bergson is the great greatest single influence on Teilhard, and he did his creative evolution, where he brought together the evolutionary ideas of uh, Darwin, together with a, uh, with a certain spirituality that comes from the Neoplatonist movement, mm -hmm. and also from the Romanticism of the uh, German world, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the, this a creative evolution is one of the, again, one of the great works mm. of the 20th century. Mm. But you were going to say something about progress, like uh, Yeah, Gerard? this um, is very relevant to the present, but it shows how, how difficult uh, a thinker can be, and uh, that we have to, uh, we have to be very careful about getting caught in things. Mm. And they are, in a certain sense, did get caught. C get caught. But that's a pathos of Teilhard. And yeah. people generally don't understand it. Either people reject him uh -huh. or they idealize him uh -huh. to such an extent uh -huh. that they don't understand the great values of Teilhard, just enormous values that uh, I mentioned as enables us to rethink the world and uh, 
And for a Christian to think of a Christ dimension of the universe in this total process and gives us this splendid vision of things, but then a person has to be um, sensitive to this aspect of Taya, where he mentions that the vitalization of matter by the creation of super molecules and so forth. But he says, was it not simply the first act, this is atomic power? Was it not, this is after he had seen the cyclotron and so forth, was it not simply the first act, even a mere prelude and a series of fantastic events, which having afforded us access to the heart of the atom, mm -hmm. would lead us on to overthrow one by one the many other strongholds which science is already besieging. Mm -hmm. So he has this, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. awesome Conquering. conquest. Yeah. Of mm -hmm. The vitalization of matter by the creation of super molecules. Then uh, this, these are listing the conquest over the vitalization of matter by the creation of super, the remodeling of the human organism by means of hormones. They just mm -hmm. discovered hormones. Now, once we have this power, we can remodel Modern. the human organism. So it was already mm -hmm. into to engineering the Bio human. Genetics, huh? Yeah, already into biogenetics. My goodness. He said, what we need, one of our greatest needs is uh, an acceptable eugenics. So, anyway, control of heredity and sex by the manipulation of genes and chromosomes. This is the 1940s. Right. Here we are in the 1980s. Yeah. Uh, when we're really faced with it, the readjustment and internal liberation of our souls by direct action upon springs gradually brought to light by psychoanalysis. The arousing and harnessing of the unfathomable intellectual and affective power still latent in the human mass. It's not every kind of effect produced by a suitable arrangement of matter. And have we not reason to hope that in the end we should be able to arrange every kind of matter following the results we have obtained in the nuclear field? This oh is in the uh, book, The Future of Man, page 149. Yes. Now, <laughs> that's a yeah. kind of a terrifying thing. Yes. yes. Now, that's why, um, along with these grand uh, things that, that we need uh, to, uh, to see that there is a, an emotional change uh, in how we view this question of the conquest of matter, oh, right. uh, rather than a sensitivity to our community with the universe and our evocation, not conquest, but evocation, people that are related to each other uh, do these things. There is the evocatory relationship. Yes. The natural world will respond to us, but our uh, mechanization of things, our controlling of things, and we tried this with all kinds of our technologies, and you see he foresaw mm. the, the technologies, mm. and, mm. but he was willing to go into mm. them with mm. a kind of a total commitment mm. to it. Now we've experienced what's happened, mm. and we see the, the devastation, the closing down of the life systems mm -hmm. of the planet. Uh, a person would say that in all of this, there is still this about uh, the issue, and it is that that we are that these uh, will hopefully be turned to more constructive um, instruments, mm -hmm. instrumentalities. But the the dangers of it so far are such. It's like the um, our control over our agricultural processes of the growing mm -hmm. of grains and so forth. Mm -hmm. We tend to uh, to overdo it, to have improper judgment. We don't accept the judgment of the natural world. That's a good point, uh, Tom. That's very important. Like but see, the world itself, and that's why um, it's necessary to go to this, because the, uh, the planet Earth, as we have it, is a result of a vast range of experimentation over billions of years, over mm -hmm. billions of years. Mm -hmm. And things have been fitted together so uh, intimately mm -hmm. that once we enter into it and start tearing apart things that have been adjusted over through a long period of development, 
And then we have to be enormously sensitive to how we, we, do, we deal with these mm-hmm. things. So uh, what is important and what I'm proposing is not a, um, uh, the um, setting Teilhard aside, but of being aware of that aspect of Teilhard mm-hmm. and being able, when we talk about Teilhard in the ecological age, he has enormous values for the ecological age, but the... Um, but the, that contribution lies precisely in the fact that that it could move the Christian world over into a religious concern for the natural the world, world yeah. first of all. And that is perhaps now uh, perhaps the single greatest thing that mm-hmm. needs to be done mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is, is that. Yeah. Tom, what, what would you say uh, to people today then who are trying to, you know, draw the richness of Teilhard and, and let it form and, and be motivating in their own lives towards, you know, action in this ecological age? Well, uh, his principles as regards the uh, zest for life mm-hmm. is one of the great principles uh, that the... Um, that taste for life that a person needs uh, has to be translated now into a source of psychic energy uh, because uh, the, the life, the changes that we have to bring about are going to require an awesome amount of human energy. Mm. We have to be intensely devoted to the, the natural world in order to save the life systems that are now threatened. There's everything is to be done. All the professions have to be uh, readjusted. And we have to uh, begin by what I would uh, identify as thinking of the human as species. And we have to find our role as species Mm. among species. Mm. And to ask not kind of what kind of world we want, but what kind of a world does the natural world want to be? What, uh, what does the earth want to be? And how do we help fulfill that role? Mm-hmm. Because we fit into that rather than the, the world fitting into to our plans. Right. But right now, we have to alter all our professions uh, and mm-hmm. so forth. Well, let me, let me give uh, what I call the three sentences where I identify what needs to be done. Uh, First of all, it's a summary of the 20th century. In the 20th century, the the glory of the human has become the desolation of the earth. Second sentence, the desolation of the earth is becoming the destiny of the human. Third sentence, all human institutions, programs, and activities, all human professions, must be judged primarily by the extent to which they inhibit, ignore, or foster a mutually enhancing human-earth relationship. Mm -hmm. Now, we need a medical practice that's based on that relationship. Human-Earth relationship. Human-Earth relationship. Not human-human or... Well, (laughs) human-human, but But primarily... Human. It's the, our relationship to the air and the water. If we're going to poison the air, poison the water, poison the soil, then, what? then it's not a mutually enhancing relationship. Yeah. And in fact, if we talk about progress, it must be progress in the life-giving qualities of the water and the life-giving qualities of the air as well as progress in the human. Mm-hmm. Because if these things do not progress, the human is not progressing. Yes. If the trees are not happy, we can't be happy. Yeah. <laughs> if the birds are not happy, we, we can't can. be happy. And we are not progressing. So it must either be total progress Mm -hmm. or no progress, Mm -hmm. or the plundering, a progress brought about by humans uh, plundering the planet uh, is is no good. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first thing is um, uh, this mutually enhancing relationship that uh, must guide all our activities and it, it goes like this, that ecology is not a part of economics. Economics is a part of ecology. Econ, our religion, our, uh, econ, our, the ecology is not a part of religion. Religion is a part of ecology. 
because the ecosystem is the primary reality. And it's the ecosystem that, that supports all the manifestations of life. And so that our adjustment whether it be in education or what, education is a part of ecology, primarily. Yes. Pri uh, ecology is not primarily part of education. Yeah. So when you say the ecological age, it really is a total new... It's a totally new... Period. Uh, it's a, we have to decenter our anthropocentric orientation. Mm -hmm. We have to become decentered from that to a biocentric or cosmocentric orientation. Why well, I call myself a geologian. Mm -hmm. We need geologians, sociologians, and so forth mm -hmm. in this sense that geology that just studies the uh, physical structure of things is not honest geog geology because geology is um, integral with everything else. Mm -hmm. And geologists are moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so nothing can be understood without understanding everything else. And nor can we have uh, a human functioning in any human order like the Constitution. I suggest the Constitution of the North American continent yes. as the only reasonable thing to do. Mm -hmm. rather than a constitution for humans. Mm -hmm. And I suggest a biocracy instead of a democracy. Mm -hmm. Because you just have a, de a, a, de a democracy, uh, you have something for humans, but to have a arrangements where just humans are, are thinking about their situation, then a person is losing out as regards a larger part of the real community. Mm -hmm. And the trees have to vote. The trees have to vote. The, yes, and the birds have to vote. The birds have to vote. Yeah. Well, and we are coming to that. Yeah. In other words, that's happening. How? Through the environmental protection program. Mm -hmm. Every time any project takes place, any significant project now, you have to have an environmental assessment made. Mm -hmm. And so, in that sense, that is kind of asking permission yeah. of the land for us to be there. Mm -hmm. That's what environmental assessment is. Yeah. Now, this has legal status, and we have also on the Hudson, we have a river keeper now. The to river keeper on, along on the Hudson. Hudson. Yeah. And Long Island Sound yeah. now has a keeper, mm -hmm. a human that speaks on the part of this. It's something like, before the law, a corporation is a person, so to speak, or an infant is, uh, can be represented. It requires somebody to represent yes. it, but uh, there's no reason why the, this cannot be arranged for. Yeah. And uh, where a court should a court. have uh, representation yeah. uh, and judgments of things, and it is, it is happening. Yeah. We don't see it, then, but it is something like this sense of this uh, barge with the garbage on it that <laughs> is adrift and cannot find anywhere to go because um, it's, it's not acceptable anywhere. Yeah, yeah. So but, in some way we're... But human, so that humans, but it represents the humans. If that is not acceptable, then we are not acceptable in our mo present mode of action. Right. So if we really think about it, we have to say that we have made ourselves unfit for the community of life. And if we make ourselves unfit for the community of life, then the community of life is going to reject us. Mm 